Chair, I move that we accept the minutes as presented. Second. Motion having been made by Beth Richardson, Richardson and seconded by Barbara Schenkel. All in favor, any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion? Motion passes 6 nothing. Uh, the next item on the agenda would be a consent agenda item for two Davis Point Lane site plan amendment. Uh, if somebody could just come up and make a brief presentation. So, very brief. So the only question I had was the uh, parking. Does it, does it change any of the parking calculations? I see a head nod on one of the other board members. Um, we have one of the parking regulations for both floors. We call for 18 or 20. We have 24 parking spaces oh. there now, so we have more than enough. Well, that's fine. And there's a shared parking thing that goes between business and, uh, and residential, so parking is ample. Okay. That's the only question I had. Any other questions, board members? <laughs> Um, Mr. Chair, if, if this goes as a consent item, does that mean that there will be no public hearing with regard to it? Right. It, it, it's just up for approval tonight. It's the interior change. Parking is the same. I mean, there's no exterior change at all. Right. Do I have a motion? Uh, motion for the board. Go ahead, Barbara. A uh, motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Andrew Ingalls of Alana LLC to amend the previous site plan approval for the building located at 2 Davis Point Lane to convert two 2,000 square foot multifamily dwelling units to four 1,000 square foot dwelling units be approved. Second. Uh, motion having been made by Barbara Schenkel and seconded by uh, Beth Richardson. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion? All opposed to the motion? I want to abstain? I want abstention. Um, motion carries five uh, in favor, uh, no opposed, and one abstention. Next item on the agenda is Thank the. You. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Blueberry Ridge uh, subdivision amendment. Joe Fristacci, if you could come up and make your presentation. I'm the developer and the builder in the subdivision. Um, a couple of years ago, I asked to increase the number of affordable lots that would be available for a buyer to choose from, to have a home built. And inadvertently, the language was uh, such that I deleted two and added two, so there was no net change. And it came to my attention by the code enforcement officer when we 
uh, started construction on a house that was um, or is designed for a, a buyer on lot number 12, which was originally an affordable home, uh, an affordable home lot. Um, so I'm here tonight to correct a language deficiency that was made a couple of years ago to reincorporate or to uh, redesignate lot number 12 for an affordable home. Uh, this is the second and the last one that is required for me to build. And it's been uh, a couple of years uh, that I've been trying to find a buyer for this home. We have one now. It's a former South Portland, uh, excuse me, Cape Elizabeth resident that is moving back to the area. The um, lot number 12 is here. First home that we built as an affordable home is lot number one. They chose this lot because it's in the cul-de-sac, and I was under the impression that it was available. So I'm here to ask for a correction to um, the, um, the plan, subdivision plan, to re-designate lot 12 as an affordable home. Thank you. You all set? Any questions from any of the board members? Hearing none. Do I hear, hear a motion? Chair, I have a motion for the board to consider. Uh, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Joseph Prestacci for an amendment to the previously approved Blueberry Ridge subdivision located off Mitchell Road to redesignate lot 12 as a moderate income affordable lot be approved as a consent agenda item. Second. A uh, motion having been made by Beth Richardson and seconded by... Uh, Barbara Schenkel, do I hear any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion? Those opposed? Motion carries 6 nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda, uh, Cape Elizabeth Family Medicine Site Plan Amendment. Um, the applicant is requesting an amendment to a previously approved site plan, and it is on the agenda for completeness. The applicant or their representative could step up and make a presentation. Thank you. I'm assuming you're loading a PowerPoint presentation. Well, I'm just going to pull up a uh, PDF site plan to speak okay. to, and I'll introduce myself as we're going. My name is Mark Wilcox. Uh, oh, okay. I'll agree for you. There you go. Just, I just want to mention this to the applicant till uh, 4.05 this afternoon, and he's pulled this together <coughs> tonight, so pretty quick response. <laughs> uh, so get an extra point here. <laughs> So you. Well, I think so. Uh, I'm not an administrator, so Is that your machine? maybe I should have put it on a PowerPoint. <laughs> I brought the paper ones also. That's I can overview the, a little bit of the project. Uh, Cape Family Medicine uh, is in a building that formerly was the Cape Elizabeth Community Center before they uh, moved over to the other side of Route 77. Uh, it's uh, a uh, general medical practice uh, owned by Craig Johnson. Uh, there was a site plan approved when uh, an addition was made for uh, examination rooms in 2004. It also included uh, a garage uh, to be added behind the existing parking lot. Uh, at this point in time, uh, Dr. Johnson is considering going forward with the building the, the uh, garage structure. 
However, we are looking at uh, placing the garage in a new location. Uh, here is an overview of the garage portion of the property. Uh, and this is the very south end. The, uh, the house is on the other side of the yard, further to the north. And the line of where the previously approved garage was at the back end of the parking lot here, uh, with uh, overhead doors facing the parking lot itself. The new design for the garage moves it about 20 feet further to the west and places the garage doors towards the uh, access road. Uh, another feature of the design at this point uh, compared to the previously approved plan is that the previously approved plan uh, because the garage doors faced the parking lot and knocked out some parking spaces, the previously approved plan added a chunk of parking lot in this area, which we now no longer need to do because of the garage doors facing to the west instead. Uh, the garage is now also a one-story structure instead of a two-story structure. Uh, it's, uh, basically sort of a ranch, if you will, design, windows along both sides of what would otherwise just be blank walls of the garage, uh, constructed out of materials to match the uh, existing house up on Shore Road, uh, so it would pretty much be within the same vocabulary and, and appearance. Uh, The roof is a, is a little more simpler, it's just a straight gable roof uh, at this point. Uh, and with uh, uh, a general clearing that would be required for the building itself, uh, moving, again, moving the clearing a little bit further also toward the access road. It's a pretty simple structure. All it is is a really a garage and a storage area, but it also does include a sort of a covered patio uh, that has a, uh, a fireplace and would be sort of a staff uh, break area, if you will, in better, better weather. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to. Here, what we have on, is, uh, if, on the agenda for tonight is completeness. Does the board have any questions uh, on any information that you feel is necessary to, in order to deem it complete? And the question is, do we want a site walk and or a public hearing? Um, Barbara, do you, you want to decide on completeness first, or how do you want to do it? Sure, if there's anybody has any questions. We no, can, I don't we have can. any questions. I have a comment. But, Go ahead. Well, I'd like to say that I, I think Peter and I are probably the only two that were on the original, for the original site plan. I think this is an immeasurably better plan than the original. I like it very much, personally. Um, the, and the only thing I'd like to discuss a little bit, because I see you have additional landscaping after we decide on completeness, is the landscaping. And then I'd like to ask Maureen if she's heard anything in terms of even bothering with the site walk in a public hearing. So. Okay, given that, I'd like to make a motion. Go ahead. Go right ahead. Uh, I'd like to make a motion for the board to consider that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Dr. Craig Johnson of Cape Family Medicine located at 1226 Shore Road for an amendment to the previously approved site plan to relocate and change a previously approved storage building be deemed complete. Be it further ordered that the above application... You know, let's go through, we'll go through completeness first. Second. Motion having been made by Tom Dolan and seconded by Barbara Schenkel. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion. Motion carries 6 nothing. That application is deemed complete. Now the question is, do we want a public hearing and or a site walk? Can we take them one at sure. a time? I don't see a need for the site walk. Um, I, I do, however, think that we should have a public hearing. Maureen, have you heard anything at all from the Rants? No, I haven't. Because the only property next door of the Rants, and we worked pretty intensively with them at the time, um, I don't... I, I honestly don't think that we, if, we, if we're satisfied, there's additional landscaping here. I think we need to hear about it. And at least personally, if we're satisfied with the landscaping plan, there aren't any neighbors on the other side. And there, the, then we get into um, 
I mean, there are no neighbors on any side but the ramps. And if we're happy with the plan, this is so much better than the original plan. And they were involved in the original plan. I can't even tell you how much better it is. It's lower, it's further away, um, it appears. Can you talk about the landscaping a little bit and, and what you're planning uh, on doing? Yes, surely. Uh, the, um, the biggest feature of the, of the landscaping in the, in the previous plan that was a major change, if you will, was uh, this, this row of existing evergreens right here, fairly mature hemlocks. Uh, this one also a fairly mature hemlock. And, and they would have needed uh, to have been uh, ripped out uh, before. Uh, they, uh, in, this, in this approach, they, they don't need to be ripped out. Uh, although this one right here actually encompasses this parking space. So it probably needs to be limbed up or, or trimmed a little bit. It's, it's pretty bushy. Uh, also, because the, uh, the garage, if you will, was right here, and the grading scheme of making a parking area here uh, required a lot of fills to the slopes in this area, some of the trees in here were going to be affected by the, by the new fills and at the toe of the slopes. And so they were going to need to be replaced by newer plantings. Uh, now that the, basically there is no cut or fill uh, anywhere in, in this area, the, uh, the garage is pretty much just inserted into, a, uh, into the nat existing natural grade. Uh, the existing trees and the buffer in this area along the fence, along the property line, aren't being disturbed. So we're looking at leaving those. There will be a good amount of grading, uh, but it will be on this end of the building, uh, because right now, going from the road, if you start at the road here and walk to the east, uh, the existing grade drops off uh, two and a half feet or so. And now, because of the proximity of the garage to the street, and the garage needs to be nine inches or so higher than the street, uh, there will be about three feet of fill uh, in, in this area right here and, and, and right underneath the garage itself. Uh, but that will be uh, uh, in a long and seated area and just blended within, within this, new, uh, this new line right along through here. Of, uh, I guess what I'm asking, what, well, originally, maybe, maybe you can answer this and maybe we should have a public hearing. I, I was under the impression, I guess I'm looking at the old plans, that more landscaping was being added, and I guess it's not. Originally, when um, the doctor started to develop, he took out some things he wasn't supposed to. Were they all replaced, or were they not, or don't you know? Uh, the site was uh, developed with a new buffer uh, in lieu of material that was there before. There was a, there was a series of small saplings that were, that were removed last time within the buffer area. And that was what were they the replaced buffer. or not? And then the buffer was beefed up in the final approved version of the plan. Okay, because that, that was a part of, of some contention. I, I'll defer to everybody else since I'm one of the people that, you know, was here and if people feel uncomfortable then that's... Does the application, yeah, I, does the applicant have an objection to uh, a public hearing? Uh, no, there's no objection to a public hearing. I feel yeah, I, I don't need a site walk. I walked it today. <laughs> but I have similar landscaping concerns to okay. Barbara's. Um, and the trees that are there now are mostly deciduous. And the original plan was for some evergreen trees, which make a better year-round buffer. OK, so the issue today is whether to have a public hearing. I'm, I'm hearing a general consensus. We're going to at least move it to the next step. Uh, people want a site walk? I, I don't feel the no. need. I'm pretty familiar with the site. Um, so we need a motion to make set a motion. Go ahead. I'd like to make a motion for the board to consider that uh, the application of Dr. Craig Johnson be tabled to the regular August 18th, 2009 meeting of the planning board, at which time a public hearing will be held. Second. A motion having been made by Tom Dolan and seconded by Beth Richardson. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion? 
Motion carries six nothing. Uh, is there any other direction we want to give the applicant? I think yeah, I, I identified have a couple so, of things. I, oh. I don't know if it's encompassed within the within our motion, but there, the letter from the town engineer um, with regard to incorporating the names of the property, the abutting property owners, and all of the other comments within that letter, I think, should be addressed one way or another. I think some of them actually have been. I think yeah. they were in, in the um, you know in the booklet. There were names. Pardon me? The names are in the booklet that we got. So I checked for them. I think some of them have been looked at, but you can just double check and make sure they're all answered. Okay. That's all. No problem. I can just add, yeah. add yep. them. Take one minute. Tom, you all set? No big deal. Yeah. I think, Liza, you all set? Yeah. Just I think you heard the landscaping concerns. Um, well, would you like to look at the old landscaping? No, I saw the old one, and I saw the phase one, phase two. I see that you never had to implement phase one because you didn't expand the parking lot. You were able to preserve those hemlocks. Those are great. Um, but they are sort of, you know, haphazard, just deciduous trees that have grown up there that are, frankly, in keeping <laughs> with the abutters landscape. But um, if it was a bone of contention previously for the abutting residential homeowner, um, it, it may be something to be considered. To consider, I mean, I think phase two was had something like seven evergreen trees in it um, yes. um, initially, and yeah. I realize that it's a smaller building that's lower and farther away, so that's a consideration. But I, I, if I were an abutting landowner. I'm, well, those, I may those want fir, to see some evergreen those trees. Fir, those fir trees uh, were fairly uh, essential because of uh, the loss of the hemlocks and, and also because there would be a big clearing opened up mm -hmm. that would almost have gone all the way to the property line. Gotcha. Yep. And uh, now... That was phase one, where you were just highlighting, I think. Right. Yep. Well, no, in the, in the phase two is when we were going to add the... Uh, the plantings in that area. So let's let's see if I can get there. I think phase two had um, five balsam firs, two white pines, one hemlock. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. And those would have been. Uh, let's see. Here's the. Here's the row where that planting was. I don't think I have a zoomer no. on this, or do I? That was, yeah. Um, Let's see if I can zoom in on that. Gotcha. And so those were actually planted behind uh, where the hemlocks were removed. Let's see if I can. Yep, some of them were, you're right. And then some of them. Just the three balsam firs were sort of to the right of the structure. These, these three yep. right here. Yeah. Because uh, by and large, this was, was all going to be cleared out to the sky. Yep. Uh, with the forest canopy still left there um, and the house further away and it presenting a porch rather than a garage. It didn't seem like it was uh, incompatible use. Right. Um, I would agree that the hemlocks provide um, good shading from the sight line from the, between the house and the proposed structure, the existing house. But I, if it was an issue, I just thought that perhaps. Well, it was, it was only it, because some things were removed, I believe, that shouldn't have been. And, and you may not have been aware, I don't know. Oh, Just yeah. when you make sure when you come back in again that the landscaping yeah. is as, as we had agreed at the time. Yes. And, uh, be and uh, if anybody wants to go by, if not on a formal site walk, there will be some uh, flags showing up there within, within a few days. Okay. Uh, I just bought them at the hardware store this morning. Uh, so you can kind of see where the corners of the building are and where that where that proposed buffer line uh, rolls through, uh, because basically we're kind of keeping that buffer line you know, about 10 feet off of the foundation wall, enough room to get machinery in there to actually do the work, but not not more than that. And that's that's where the silt fence would be. Also, I believe the town engineer has asked for a little bit more clarification on a uh, 
what do they call it? A loman, not a loman seating, a uh, erosion. erosion control plan. We had a silt fence detail in the 2004 plan, but we can kind of update that into the new plan also. That's not a problem also. I put a, then put a narrative about loaming and seeding and stabilizing the construction area around the building. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to make this project bigger or more sure. expensive than it needs to be. I, I just thought I would want to make sure that we incorporate the abutters concern. And we're still going to have the public hearing, yeah. so I just wanted to give them some direction, but yeah. that's, and that's fine. Any other comments or questions? Well, it's not really labeled here, but just for your reference, you can see this, this tree line that comes down here and then comes over and goes back. That's kind of a finger of grass that comes off of the back end of the, of the Rand's lawn. And then this is sort of a, a large amount of brown cover and, and, uh, and larger plantings in, at the back of their yard also. But, but from, a, from about there up, it's basically the tree line and the plantings line goes right along the property line. That's a large grassed area right there. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This really is a much better plan, though. Thanks. So thank you. Thank you. That's it. We don't need to vote on anything else because we're not going to do a site work. Next item on the agenda. Mahoney Resource Protection Permit. My name is John Mitchell, and I represent uh, Mike and Andy Mahoney for a resource protection permit application. Sheet one is uh, the, the top. The top plan is a site plan that shows most of the uh, autumn tide subdivision, and the bottom sheet uh, is a an enlargement of the subject property, which is lot one of the subdivision. Um, the wetlands were uh, the wetlands were marked by uh, Mark Hampton of uh, Mark Hampton Associates as part of the overall subdivision. And they, they lie uh, mostly in this area here. Um, the wetlands meet the definition of, of the Town of Cape Elizabeth's RP2 wetland. And they relate mostly to old drainage swales that were part of the agricultural um, farming of this, of this property, the latent property. Um, and it basically, they drain the swales, drain the areas up by Wells Road uh, towards the rear of the property. Uh, the vegetation within the impact area, which is located right here, uh, consists mostly of uh, wetland grasses and ferns, and those are illustrated in your booklet uh, by the, the two photographs. Uh, the driveway servicing lot one that was shown on the subdivision plan is an old farm road. It's better seen on this uh, plan here. Um, it was an old farm road, and the developer used the location of this old farm road uh, for the designated driveway for lot one. Um, unfortunately, the driveway, as you can see, is located on the, along the southerly boundary line of the, of the property. And given the, the siting and the design of the home, um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work well. Um, the home is, generally wants to be sited in the, the middle of the property 
with a southerly orientation uh, for, to maximize solar gain and to uh, optimize the, the optimum views are in this direction here. So what uh, Andy and Mike are proposing uh, is to relocate the drive uh, 45 feet in a northerly direction to this point here. Uh, it would then cross this drainage swale in this area here. I'm sorry, my hand is shaking. Uh, and then, um, and this would result in a much uh, shorter driveway. Uh, it relates much better to the, the garage, which is on the northerly side of the, the lot um, and less impervious surface. Uh, it will require um, an extension of an existing 12-inch culvert, which is located here, uh, so that we're not going to alter any of the drainage flows um, uh, heading down in this direction here. Uh, the, the total impact amounts to uh, 980 square feet of wetland, uh, which when added to the cumulative impact of the subdivision, it still doesn't exceed the 4,300 square feet of uh, uh, the 4,300 square foot threshold that DEP has for permit by rule. Uh, we have minimized the wetland uh, impact uh, to the extent possible. We, we've, uh, we've shifted it 45 feet and we've also, we have not uh, got into any of the, the more sensitive uh, wetlands which are adjacent, are in this area here, the Cat and Nine Tails. So that, that basically is the extent of our request. Um, in terms of the completeness list uh, for the resource protection permit, I believe the only item on the complete list, completeness list that was considered incomplete uh, was the designation of utilities. And we didn't designate the utilities, which are now shown on the site plan right here, because the stubs are already existing. Um, the developer had already installed the stubs, to the property line and there won't be any further impact of wetlands um, with respect to the utilities, but we have shown them on the revised plan. So with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Sure. Um, this is on for completeness, so does the board have any questions on the motion? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. I'd like to make a motion for the board to consider that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Michael and Andy Mahoney for a resource protection permit to alter 980 square feet of wetland with a driveway crossing uh, lot one located at one autumn ties lane be deemed complete. Second. Motion having been made by Tom Dolan and seconded by Beth Richardson. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none. All in favor of the motion. Motion carries six nothing. Question to the board is do we want to have a site walk? I'm, I'm not interested in Okay, so that issue is off, and the um, next issue is whether we will have a public hearing, which I think we need. Yes, a lot of bobbing, yes. Really? I think so. I think it's important. Really? Well, we have one letter from the lady across the street that says she's fine with it. It's such a minimal change. Huh? I'd like to make a motion. Um, I'd like to make a motion for the board to consider that the above application be tabled into the regular public hearing. August 19, 2009, meeting, yeah, that's so. a, that's August 18, 2009, meeting of the planning board at which time a public hearing will be held. Motion having been made by Tom Dolan and seconded by Beth Richardson. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion? Motion carries 6 nothing. We'll see you. Okay, thank you very much. August 18th. Next item on the agenda, the uh, Tara, Tara Site Plan, Shore Road, Tara LLC is requesting a site plan review for a retail office multifamily unit use building change of use located at 553 Shore Road and it's on for tonight for completeness. If the applicant could step up to the podium and make their presentation. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm John Mitchell, and I represent uh, 
Shore Road, Tara. Excuse me, John. Yeah. I have yeah. one housekeeper I have to take care of. Um, I disclose this in the workshop, but for the public record, I'd like the uh, record to reflect that I serve on uh, CIF with the, the principal of the applicant, Lee Wilson. Uh, I do not believe that that would impact my, or impair my ability to render an impartial decision, but our rules require that I put that out to the board. And if anyone has any other uh, questions or comments or wants to discuss the item, it's, it's on the table right now. Hearing none. John, go ahead. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, John Mitchell, Mitchell & Associates. I represent uh, Shore Road Tara LLC. <clears throat> um, with me this evening is Lee Wilson, the owner and applicant of Tara, and Tom Fedeli of Fedeli Mahoney. Um, this sheet, sheet one, is a um, existing conditions plan. Um, showing the subject property in relation to the abutting um, landowners. Uh, it is a 10,460 uh, square foot lot with frontage on Shore Road, um, located at 553 Shore Road. Uh, there is a two and a half uh, story Victorian style structure located here um, with a, a small 410 square foot garage located in the rear. Uh, the owners purchased the property approximately six years ago and uh, have recently completed a major restoration of the front portion of the structure in the porch. Uh, the parcel is located in the business district A, the BA district, um, which abuts the BA district uh, in this location and uh, adjacent on the uh, Nobley side of the lot. Uh, the RC district is located here. The zone line actually goes up and comes over like this. Uh, access to the site is off of Shore Road with a 10 foot wide driveway that extends at this point and extends to the rear of the property. Um, it's a paved driveway and there is a, a, uh, an area in the back in front of the garage uh, that will allow for parking. There are presently six uh, six trees, six major trees that are on the property. There are three maple trees located here. Uh, there are two uh, pine trees that they're old, they're, they're not very attractive. Uh, they've lost all their lower limbs um, and they're in pretty poor condition. And then the, the, uh, there's a 48 foot or 48 inch uh, copper beach located here, which is absolutely magnificent in between the driveway and the side property line. Uh, there is a, this little rectangular box here represents a, the uh, subsurface wastewater disposal system that was installed in 1993. Um, there is a little septic tank which is adjacent to the porch and then is piped into this, uh, this chamber system. Um, just to give you a little idea of the character of the, the property uh, around the perimeter, uh, there are these two maple trees, as I mentioned, and there is a, um, a split rail fence um, extending up this property line. Uh, the rear property line consists of a uh, fairly tall lilac hedge, uh, as well as um, a stockade, a six-foot-high stockade fence on a portion of that line. Uh, the northerly property line is, is pretty much open. Uh, we, have, we do have the Copper Beach and there is a maple tree just off of 553 property located here and the two pine trees. But other than that, it's um, fairly open. And then we have the frontage along Shore Road where we have uh, the two um, maple trees. The proposal for Tara consists of the conversion of the existing structure into a mixed-use building, uh, consisting of a small boutique shop on the first floor, which would employ uh, 
three to four part-time employees, a one or two small office space on the second floor, office suites, which may have one or two employees, and a studio apartment on the third floor for one or two residents. Um, other than the residents on the third floor, the building would be closed by six or seven every night and open around eight o'clock in the morning, eight or nine. The, the, entrance, um, the entrance to the, to the new development is, is roughly in the same location. Uh, we've held this edge here. However, we have widened the entrance from 10 feet to 18 feet to allow for better two-way circulation. The site distances in this location are excellent. Uh, we have in excess of 300 feet in either direction. Uh, a total of 10 parking spaces are required uh, for the proposed uses. Uh, we are showing six spaces. There are three in the front, three in the back, including a handicap space um, on, the, on the property. The remaining four parking spaces are off-site uh, on a neighboring property diagonally across the street. Um, at 546 Shore Road, and uh, this would be through a lease agreement with the abutting property owner. And that lease agreement is in your booklet under Exhibit 9. Uh, pedestrian circulation, we're uh, proposing a brick sidewalk along Shore Road, along the frontage of Shore Road. Uh, as well as a brick sidewalk which enters the site, uh, runs along the three parking spaces to the front, um, to the front stairs. Uh, there's also a small brick walk in the rear uh, accessing the side porch. Utilities. Um, Essentially, all the utilities that currently serve the, the property are adequate to serve the, the proposed uses. Uh, the, subs, the subsurface wastewater uh, system Not, it's not getting the third slide. Uh, which one, Maureen? Oh. Okay, the, oh, I see, I see. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, the subsurface wastewater disposal system uh, was evaluated, evaluated by Albert Frick um, recently and his report was submitted to Bruce Smith, and Bruce Smith has written a letter. Um, and both of those are in the booklet, uh, the report and Bruce Smith's letter. Uh, one of the things that we're gonna have to do with, this, with the system, because we are placing the parking uh, pavement over a portion of the system, we're gonna have to raise the grade uh, slightly in this this grading plan reflects uh, raising the grade approximately 12 inches uh, to create um, stability over the, over the chamber systems.
Um, we, in terms of lighting, we have a single uh, pole mounted fixture located right here, which will um, illuminate the front portion of the property. Um, it's, it's mounted on a 12 foot pole. It has cutoff lens. It will have a cutoff lens to it. It will also have a house side shield located to uh, minimize any extraneous light spilling over the property. Uh, the light will be turned off uh, during evening hours or after, um, after they close the, the building. Uh, there will also be a couple uh, ground mounted sign lights located adjacent to the sign which will illuminate uh, both sides of the sign. And both the pole mounted fixture and the light sign lights are illustrated in the booklet under Exhibit 8. Um, in terms of fencing, screening, and landscaping, um, I do want to say that for, for several weeks, or I should say for at least a couple weeks, uh, Lee has been meeting with uh, both of the adjacent neighbors uh, discussing and listening to their concerns about uh, screening and buffering. And I think the best way to describe to you uh, the results of those meetings uh, is to uh, go around the property and I will show you what we're proposing, which basically came out of uh, the neighbor meetings. Um, Beginning along this line here, uh, we're, we're starting a fence, uh, a six foot high solid wood fence. It's the scallop style, which was suggested by the neighbor, and we agreed. Um, and beginning at this point here, extending down this property line 56 feet, which would take the fence past our turnaround to this point here. Um, there, as I mentioned, there is a a very nice perennial garden located here, which is enjoyed by both 553 and the adjacent property. Um, so um, the, the fence begins at this point uh, basically because um, Jane Nicholas, the abutter next door, did not want the fence to extend up to the garage. Running along the frontage of the property, uh, we are uh, planting three deciduous, small deciduous flowering crab apples. Uh, the reason for the, the, the size is because we have relatively low overhead wires in this location. We can't really put anything that is going to grow too tall. So we have selected uh, uh, some flowering crab apple trees that will grow up to 15 to 20 feet. Um, and those will be planted uh, within the esplanade. Uh, there'll also be some new uh, perennial plantings around the sign located here. Uh, running along the southerly property line, uh, as I mentioned, we have these two fairly good sized maple trees that, uh, that create uh, dense shade and have very low overhanging branches. Uh, but what we are proposing, and this was uh, mutually agreed upon, is beginning the uh, same style fence as we're putting on this side, a six foot high solid wood fence, scallop style, um, stained, um, a white, a white color, is that right? um, beginning at a point which is 10 feet off of the rear property line and extending 48 feet to this point here. Um, it was mutually agreed that we would extend the fence uh, one section or eight feet beyond this existing maple tree. Um, these three, uh, or these three uh, trees here are new six foot high hemlock trees that will provide uh, year round or evergreen screening from the adjacent property. Um, and then underneath this maple tree, we're proposing a combination of broadleaf evergreen um, and some uh, hosta and azalea plantings. Um, the maple trees uh, have very shallow roots 
and it would be uh, it would do great harm to this existing maple tree if we had to put anything larger than what we're proposing. And I believe um, I believe the Samford's uh, concur with that. Uh, and then I'm sorry on the on the the rear property line um, we are going to install. Uh, we're going to continue the six-foot-high stockade fence. Uh, currently, it stops here. We're going to continue it a distance of 40 feet down to the corner um, and minimizing the, uh, any cutting or removal of, of the lilac hedge that's there. Some branches will have to be cut to, to get this thing installed, but um, we're going we're gonna to absolutely minimize uh, that. So I believe that we've, we've met the buffering standards um, and I think the neighbor, neighbor meetings have been very productive and um, uh, I think, you know, it's, it's created a, a, a very nice plan. Uh, finally, the waiver requests, um, as mentioned in our booklet, there are two waivers that we're requesting. One is the identification of existing trees within 200 feet that are eight inches in diameter or greater. Um, and the second waiver are stormwater calculations. And uh, the reason for that waiver is that the increase in the rate of flow uh, is very minimal and would not, uh, would not, is, is very negligible and would not show up in the calculations. And I believe both of those uh, waiver requests um, were concurred by the town engineer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so what we have on for tonight is completeness. And does the board have any questions of the applicant uh, on any of the issues? Elaine. I have two questions. The first one on the parking arrangement, you said it's on the opposite side of the street. What is the provision for getting people across the street there? Is there a crosswalk anywhere in the area, or is that a safe place for people to get across Shore Road? I don't believe there's an existing crosswalk. Something I think we'll need to think about. The other just question I had, you say that the exterior light on the pole is going to go off when the retail stores close. What is the arrangement for having exterior lighting to serve the tenant of the apartment? There, um, Lee, you may know better than I do on this. Um, I believe that there are lights at the entrances on the yeah, house, on right. on the house. Yeah, uh, both at the front door and the side door. The side door would most likely be the yeah. door she would, or he would be using. Um, and we felt that that was sufficient. That's existing lighting on the That's building. Right. I have a question regarding the lease agreement for the extra parking spaces. Why was it left open two to four spaces rather than providing for the required incremental? Well, when I talked to him about when I talked to him about it, we really weren't sure um, if we were going to need two to four. We of course learned that we definitely will need four, and I just. Um, you know, so that way it sort of covered both bases. Can I follow up with that? It's a, for a term of three years. And yep. so what happens at the expiration of the three years with regard to our zoning? Is it still mandatory because it's mandatory to have the 10 spaces? Three years is the same term that the planning board accepted for an off-site parking arrangement for the inn by the sea. Mm -hmm. At the time, that planning board decided was sufficient to meet the standards. But it, but it is, in fact, still a requirement that for the, for the permitted use of the property that there would still be a requirement to have four off-site spaces. You still need to meet the parking requirement. Yes. And this may not be an issue of completeness, but it's a follow-on to Elaine's point about the crosswalk. And that is that um, I noticed that there was no sidewalk then. Um, in the adjacent property, the Nichols property. So if someone were to cross on a crosswalk or other 
wise, then how would they get to the Terra property once they had crossed Shore Road? They walk on the shoulder. Yeah, it, it was, there's a paved shoulder. It's mm -hmm. a fairly wide paved shoulder located uh, right here. Um, I'm not sure of the exact width, but um, it, visually it looks like four or five feet wide. That's a nice worry. Do we want a site walk? With that. Do we want a site walk? Oh, I, I'm an advocate. No In the comprehensive plan, it talks about um, connecting business districts with sidewalks, and I'm a huge advocate of sure. um, having sidewalks in every business district in sure. town. No, I think we definitely want okay. a yeah. sidewalk. All right, let's finish up with the oh, questions. Oh, the sidewalk. Yep. I said sidewalk. <laughs> okay, uh, Liza, you all set? Yes. Barbara? Do you want to finish with the question? Yes. Before we have yes. Okay. I just wanted to get the consensus right. while the issue was fresh. I, how much difference would it make? I, I was actually shocked to find out the property was on septic and not public sewer. What would be the difference in cost? And I think cost is really the factor here uh, between hooking up, because Beth tells me there is sewer in that area. Is there sewer or no sewer? There, there is sewer in the area. It's, we don't have... There is a is there sewer in front of the property? There's, there's sewer on uh, Charles Road, which go down, and it's back up okay. the distance on Charles so Road. So then the, the cost to hook up would be much greater than trying to shore up that it would area. Be significant. Okay. It would be significant. Then I'm not going to ask the question. But I, but yeah, I, I discussed this during the workshop. There's also sewer roughly in this location here it's a big um, transfer line that the Fulton Water District owns and that would also be significant okay. because it, well it's all wedged for one thing but we'd have to shut down the whole system to, to no, I understand yeah. I mean the cost factor is primary in that consideration. But is it, yeah. Isn't the calculations for this use actually less I was just than the say, current use? I was just going to say. Yes, it is yes, probably. But I, mean, I was just shocked that a 10,000 square foot lot had it's much septic less. on it. Work. But anyway, um, the parking agreement I think needs to be amended for the submission to four lot, four spaces, so you're in compliance. With, I mean, it's nothing but rewording it. Um, the landscaping looks good. How about the exterior light levels? Um, do they meet code less than half candles? Yeah, there's, there's a photometric in your I did. I read it, but I couldn't find the light. I can never read those things. Yeah, right it now. does meet. It's a 100 watt Thank high you. pressure, uh, 100 watt metal halide. When it comes to light levels and sheet flows, you know, all those funny numbers, I, don't, I still don't get it. So that's a okay. very lie on people who know more than I do. Um, there is a comment made about the side and rear yard setbacks, and I realize these are grandfathered probably. Uh, 20 feet if it abuts a residential area, is there a violation there? And there's something about an encroachment. And I couldn't find, I don't know where the encroachment is. There's no, there's no encroachment. Um, okay, so there was an error in, I forgot where I he, that. He, I think he just, um, he made the comment, he, he, he wasn't saying that there was an encroachment, he said, uh, he asked the question if there was an encroachment, but both the building and the garage were built in the early 1900s. No, I know, so it's would be great. My grandfather. Okay. I don't have anything else asked all my questions, so. All set? Okay, so we still have to have a motion on complete. I'd make a motion. Go ahead. Motion for the board to consider the based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented. The application of Shore Road Tara LLC for site plan review of a change of use of an existing building located at 553 Shore Road from single family home to a multi use building of retail office single unit, multi family unit, multi family unit be deemed complete. Second. Motion having been made by Tom Dolan and seconded by Beth Richardson. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion? All opposed? Motion carries 6 nothing. So the next question is, when can we set up the site walk? And I know we all have our calendars. <laughs> we got the memo. <laughs> Let's 
I'll be gone all next week, so. So we're looking at the uh, the week starting August 3rd, is that correct? Would that be enough time, Maureen? It's just that anything you come up with at the sidewalk, the applicant won't be able to in include in any new submission since the submission's due July 31st. First. Well, I, I guess I could go on, on my own. Um, I, I probably would. Unless we want to squeeze it's it in the this parking week. that I really want to talk about on the site. This week? This week? No, this week. Oh, this week. Oh, this week is. Fortunately, we have sunlight, so evening Horrible. should work rather than. Um, I, I can't do it. I get, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Tell, I, tell us when you The only time I can't do it is Friday. Well, I could, I could probably do it Thursday after your working hours or something. But. And I can't go Thursday. Who are we losing for Thursday? I Tom? Tomorrow, I guess. I'll be in sure Augusta. Oh, I can. I could do it late tomorrow. Five, five thirty. Which day? Thursday the twenty third. Okay, five or five thirty. Five thirty. Five thirty. Okay, good. Thursday the twenty third. Okay. Okay. So do we have any other questions, comments, thoughts, suggestions for the applicant? And if there aren't any, what we need is a motion to set this for a public hearing. I'd like to make a motion. Motion for the board to consider that the above application be tabled to the regular August 18, 2009 meeting of the planning board at which time a public hearing will be held. Second. Motion having been made by Tom Dolan and seconded by Beth Richardson. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion? All opposed. Motion carries six nothing. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll see you on the 18th. Actually, we'll see you on the 23rd. Uh, next item on our agenda: the shoreland zoning amendments. I think we're going to take a five-minute break. Then we'll start with the shoreland zoning.
soon as you're, you're all set. All right, we're back on the uh, on the air. The shoreland zoning amendments in the town plan is going to make a presentation. These pretty much are the same amendments that you held a public hearing on a couple of months ago. Um, under state law, there are very specific requirements that the public hearing has to be noticed by. And we missed one of the requirements. You have to have a notice in the newspaper at 12 days before the public hearing and at seven days. And we had a public notice in the newspaper at seven days and at six days. So it's back before you primarily to comply with the notice requirements. Uh, we've also done a better job of showing what the map changes are. We've prepared more detailed maps than what we had last time. Those maps have been not only advertised in the newspaper, but also they've been mailed to the individual property owners affected. Um, the text of the amendments actually were voted, recommended by the planning board to the council. The council sent them to the ordinance committee. The ordinance committee basically made two comma corrections. And so what you're seeing is pretty much what you saw before. Um, the only, only thing in here that's different from what is a mandatory requirement from the state is there is the uh, recommendation from the planning board that uh, for properties that are in the wetland buffer and are non-conforming that they can change the activities inside the building as long as there's no exterior change and as long as the activities inside the building are permitted in an abutting district. So that is one provision that's in here that's not required by the state shoreland zoning. Other than that, uh, pretty much everything in here is a state requirement. We have submitted the text of the amendments to the DEP in a draft review and received uh, a verbal okay that so far what we have for a draft would be considered in compliance with the state minimum standards. I probably should also point out that we were re required to bring our ordinance into compliance on July 1st, so we're a little behind the date on that. Uh, what I'd like to do is just briefly, if you're interested, go over the specific map changes. Um, I'd like to point out, for the most part, I don't really see these as significant map changes. Uh, but what I've done, it, it's very difficult to show you changes in the map because in Cape Elizabeth, we not only have the state shoreland zoning, which is required to be applied to wetlands that are 10 acres or more inside or wetland pond complexes. We also have our own 250 foot RP1 buffer, which applies to all RP1 wetlands. So for the purposes of mapping, we do not show you the 250 foot buffer because it's just too hard to understand everything. Just interpret when you see these maps that whenever you see these deep green colors, there's a 250 foot buffer that extends from the upland edge. So what you're seeing on here are RP1 wetlands and the dotted area is shoreland zoning and you're pr pretty much showing you the new shoreland zoning areas that the new areas that shoreland zoning is being applied to and we're also showing places where the state maps are showing a change in the wetland boundaries. Let me, I'll go into that in a minute. So for your purposes, I actually did two sets of maps for you. I did one map that was existing map, and then the second one was the shoreland zoning changes. And if you go back and forth between the two, it's the easiest way to see the difference. So for here, Crescent Beach, Crescent Beach State Park, one of the requirements under the state is that areas that have been rated moderate or high value for wildlife must have a 250 foot buffer. And the way that the town of Cape Elizabeth deals with that is we already have a 250 foot buffer, but we do have some provisions that in some very unique circumstances, the buffer can be reduced from 250 feet to 100 feet. Well, where you have a moderate or high value wetland, those circumstances do not apply. And the way we depict that on the map is we show a very heavy line. So right here, you see a brand new heavy line for the Crescent Beach area. And um, that's, that's the only change, is the, 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 the wetland is still in the same place, the shoreland zoning is still in the same place, um, but we're adding this heavy line so it says you can't reduce the buffer. It has to be minimum, a minimum of 250 feet wide. Um, the second map is um, the Cross Hill Jordan Farm area. This is probably one of the more significant changes to the shoreland zoning maps, but in practice, it really is not a change. 
And this is where I get to the explanation of, in the Town of Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance, it says that, that resource protection boundary lines must be field verified. What that means is we have um, wetland mapping for the entire town that's based on the county soils map, and that's based on aerial photography. It's pretty good mapping for a town-wide basis, but it really is not accurate enough at a parcel level. So what we require property owners to do when they come before the planning board with development proposals is they need to actually have someone go on their property, a wetland expert, and map the wetlands on their property. So what you're seeing here are actually wetlands that we have already mapped as part of the Cross Hill subdivision and as part of the Deer Run Road subdivision. And these, these wetlands are, are also showing up on the state shoreland zoning wetland mapping. And what I'm showing here is to amend the town's zoning map to show these wetlands that we know already exist. I'm further specifying that the boundary lines of these wetlands would be based on the field mapping for those two subdivisions and not the field map, not the mapping that's been done by the state because the field mapping of the two subdivisions is more accurate than whatever the state has picked up. The other positive of that is that with both of those subdivisions, once we did the wetland mapping, we required that either property lines or at least the building envelope of a lot was outside the 250 foot buffer. So by adopting this new zoning change, you're really not affecting the buildability of any lot that's already been approved for construction. It's the same lines that we're using. Any questions there? One more. Yep. It's procedural. Since we're mm -hmm. effectively correcting a procedural error by having the public hearing, Yes. Um, the public hearing notice incorporates all the changes that you're talking about now. Yes. And when you said earlier that, you, that we've sent notice vis-a-vis uh, -vis mail to property owners affected, yes. how did you determine which property owners would be affected? For what I did is I, I looked at every, if you can look underneath here, let's see. Um, you can see like right here, this line, yeah. this is a property line. So what we did is we grabbed every lot that was in this area um, and the abutters. So we sent some notices to these people here. We sent some notices to these people here. Um, the Jordan family owns much of this land, so the Jordan family got some notices. Um, we actually, under ironically, under the state law, we are not required to send map change notices directly to property owners, but we did it anyway. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right, um, and I, it might make sense to spend a little time on these maps just because I think that's where some of the questions are going to be. Um, this here is the Great Pond area, and you know, it's really six one half dozen of another on, on Great Pond. I probably have at least three different outlines of Great Pond. Um, it's a wetland with a water body, and it tends to change over time. The concept here is that the state is now saying that the shoreland zoning, which is in that green hatched area, um, that we're, we're zoning the water of Great Pond resource protection as well as the adjacent wetlands. Fine. Under our local resource protection, we would have counted it anyway. Um, also, you can see how the outline has changed. On the edges, it shows some hatched area. Again, we're just picking up the mapping that the state has done for shoreland zoning. But I, I would also argue that if that area is RP1 soils right now, it's going to be regulated as an RP1 wetland right now. Because of that requirement we have in our ordinance that you have to field map and field verify those resource protection bound lines. So technically, I don't really see there's a lot of changes here. Uh, but the, state, the, the state's going to be looking at Great Pond. It's a high-value wetland, and I've shown these mapping changes to better comply with what the state already has for shoreland zoning mapping. So along those lines, Maureen, let's assume that four years out, uh, a property owner is looking to make some form of a change. Uh, Say, like, someone here or something. Right. Yeah. And they do the field verification at that point in time, and right. uh, they note that the wetland has decreased in size or right. moved somewhere, the controlling map would be the, the uh, site field verified map. Yes, that's, that's been our standard practice and I believe it is, is completely supported by both text language in the ordinance and the official zoning map. Anything else? 
Um, so again, when you see the red hatch, that's RP1 that's being eliminated. The green hatch is RP1 that's being added. The black dotted area is shoreland zoning that's being added because of the changes in the resource protection boundary lines. And then the red dots are the shoreland zoning that's being eliminated because of changes in the resource protection boundary lines. And then um, right here is the other, I think, sig most significant map change. And this is an area where on one side you have right here is Shore Road. Um, and we, we know that there's a wetland here. Um, there are, have been at least one property owner in this area who has applied for a building permit to the code officer and done some mapping and we've picked up this mapping. So this line is not based on any field mapping we've done for a subdivision. It's based on the line that the state has given us for shoreland zoning. But um, it's no surprise that there is an RP1 wetland here. So this would all be added, RP1 right here. And then of course this would be the added shoreland zoning. Any questions? What's uh, right there? Right here? No, up. That, no, the regular old green there. Was that existing? That's existing RP1, and it would stay existing. This is, these are good examples of RP1 that we already have mapped, that we protect with a 250 foot buffer, but they don't have a shoreline zoning buffer around them because they're less than 10 acres in size. Any other questions? That's all I have for map changes. You all set? Given that this is a public hearing, I'd like to uh, open it up. Anyone wishing to speak concerning either the map changes or the text amendments, please step up to the microphone, identify yourself, state your address, and give us your input. Chairman, members of the Planning Board, my name is Jack Roberts. I live at 185 Fowler Road. And would it be possible to get the map up on the board? Some of my comments are town-wide, but obviously the majority of what I wanted I'm concerned about is Fowler Road. If you could uh, help us identify your particular lot. Anyway, for me to identify them. I'm going to use this right here. Just don't put it in anyone's eye. Okay. On the map there? Yep. Try not to hit anybody and blind them, right? <laughs> Let's see. Okay, that will, right there would be my lot. As you can see, that new line um, comes right up to my front door. Mike, um, I sit. The house sits 110 feet back from Fowler Road, which is a major uh, connector road, state identified. On the water side of the road, there is currently a hoss paddock. We've had cows and chickens and pigs over there as well. Um, and then the wetland begins after that. My, I've got a number of concerns. Uh, one, that a connector road such as Fowler Road should be a natural divide and anybody on the inland side of that road should not be affected by the Great Pond wetland zoning. Um, I'm sitting at 20 feet above sea level. The pond sits at zero sea level, so there's a, a major elevation change. The town salts, sands the road routinely all winter long because it is a connector road, yet they have no process for collecting any other runoff, which is allowed to go directly into Great Pond. Yet, a number of years ago, I tried to put a five-foot addition on my garage so I could put my boiler out front on an existing chimney, and it was disallowed because I was within the 250 feet. It, um, I had the, the building inspector at the time, the town manager at the time, and uh, the chair of the council all came down and all said, this is ridiculous, it does not make sense, but that's the way it's written. There is no right of appeal. If you're stuck in this zone and you want to do something, you can't appeal it. The only recourse, I guess, if you take some to start to build something, let the town take you to court. And I'm not sure that that's the route that most people want to go. Wetland zoning 
was originally intended to stop things like Commons Beach and Standish, where they literally had a beach with a 400 by 2,000 foot marsh and wetland behind it that they backfilled and built cottages on. We've gone from the sublime to the ridiculous, where people sitting, I sit on a, basically an old geological sandbar. I had a swimming pool dug eight feet deep in April and no water came up through that hole. They came into my yard because they couldn't get into other areas of town to do it because their backyards were too wet. I'm no, I, the water does not leave my property. It sinks right down through that sand. Um, I have actually a green yard this year, but typically by the end of May it's brown because there's nothing holding the water. It goes down, I sit high, I sit dry. I would like to see the planning would recommend that that be a natural divide and, and not do that. I also have a concern with the notice that went out, and I know it's standard, uh, I won't blame Maureen for that, but I think there may be one person here from Old Colony Lane. I had another neighbor from Fowler Road that I called who was unaware that if your property sits in a shoreland zone and you list it for sale, it has to be disclosed that you are, listed, you are now in a shoreland zone. You're taking people's property rights and the resale value of their properties oftentimes in areas that are totally inappropriate. Um, Maureen had mentioned that the black line is a significant area for the state identified. You'll notice it does not go along Fowler Road. The houses that are built on the water side are all on filled land on that particular side of the street. They have more rights than the ones across the street because I could not build forward for my garage, but somebody sitting on filled land, basically in the wetland, could build forward to the street on their property because they'd be building away from the wetland. <laughs> yeah, I, all you can do is just either laugh or cry about that one. Um, so, I, and I would love to have a site walk so people can see it. Either I'm recently ret retired, I would be at home anytime someone wanted to come by and, and see what I'm talking about, or you can do it as a group, it doesn't matter to me. But before you make a decision, I would hope and strongly recommend you come in at least to that particular area. And then maybe other people may address other areas of time where it's appropriate as well. The properties along Fowler Road on the inland side do not belong in a shoreland protection zone. Thank you very much. And Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, Maureen knows how to get in touch with me. Thanks, Jack. Anyone else wishing to speak concerning the uh, proposed changes? Uh, I'm Nelson Silva. I live at 11 Old Colony Lane, and I did receive the notice. Unfortunately, the map is so small and the key ledger is so tiny that not until tonight did I realize what that shore zone, new shore zone area meant. And I'm sure that uh, when I get back, I'm also president of the Homeowners Association, King's Grant. When I get back from the neighborhood, I'm going to have a lot of uh, neighbors who are going to be completely shocked. Because, I mean, we knew we were on a wetland. We knew we had restrictions on what we could, what you could do with your property. But uh, this expansion, I mean, we have now, uh, I can't, well, let's see. This is mine. Oh, here we go. I think you need to scroll. Yeah, there we go. Stop. Okay. Old Colony Old Lane. Uh, this. Bear with me. I don't know how this thing works. Oh, there's a button. Okay. This is Old Colony Lane coming off of Shore Road. And I live basically right over right over here. Now, we have, now this zone has now expanded into homes all on this side, and this completely wipes out a lot of people. Um, the other problem we have, in the last six years, we've had beaver that have moved down from upstream down here and built dams and expanded that wetland. Because when we moved here 11 years ago, that land was basically dry except in the summer months when you had heavy rains. 
when it was dry, you could see the brook, and the brook would come down through here, and then the little stream would go right up along Robinson's property and crawl down the property and then dump into the pond that now goes out to the culvert into the ocean. Well, they dammed all of this up, so consequently, we've had a lake for the last five or six years. And I know something about wetlands because where I used to live, I had, I was involved in a wetland dispute and uh, on the other side, supporting the wetlands. And I know a vegetation, to talk about wetland vegetation because that's what we use for the boundaries. And we have vegetation now on our banks, our banks are eroding, and we have vegetation on our banks that are wetland vegetation that weren't there 10 years ago when we, before the beavers moved in. So consequently, you have beavers damming up the waterway, so you've increased the, the water stand, and then we add the 250 feet, and then you come in with the new shore zone, and you basically are wiping out seven or eight homes, properties, values. I mean, we have people, those homes right now, they're under major construction, and they I know, they don't even know what's going to affect their, their sellability. So I, you know, I just, it doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. And then yet, in other areas, we're a, somehow we're able to put in roads and, and, and cross wetlands and not a problem, but yet, you know, over here it just becomes a problem. So there doesn't, doesn't seem to be any continuity. And I know it's a 10-acre thing, but I, I just, I don't see the continuity. I mean, I know, uh, you know, I've been to meetings, you're talking about shore, shore road pathway, you've got Dyer Pond down the road, you've got wetlands, you're going to be Part of the pathway is going to cross right over that culvert, which is in the shore zone now. So I don't know how this is all going to work, folks. It's a touchy subject, I know, and I know the state makes rules, but somebody has to have some common sense as to what this does. I mean, are you, what, are you going to buy out all the homes or put everybody down to zero value? I don't know. But I, it needs to be, something needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak concerning the... Uh Proposed shoreland zone amendments and map changes. Anyone else wishing to speak? Going once, going twice. Public hearing is closed. Uh, Maureen, do you have any thoughts or comments concerning both uh, Mr. Roberts and Mr. Silvers? <laughs> I mean, part part of this is constrained by the state requirements. Is, is well, I, I mean, I don't, you know. I was hired in late 1990. The wetland regulations, basically what we have, be, took effect in May of 1990. And I spent the next five years that I was here amending the wetland regulations pretty much every year. Um, so I understand very well that people are not thrilled with the 250-foot buffer. But there's a couple of problems here. Yes, the state is requiring us to do this but you can ask the state to make adjustments based on local conditions. Okay. The reason that that heavy... Meaning, meaning the individual the town, homeowner or the, the town? town is, can, is it, is the town can, can come back to the state with adjustments to the shoreland zoning. And the reason that that heavy dark line doesn't go all the way around Great Pond sure. is because the town said that portion of Great Pond is densely developed under the town's definition. Therefore, we would like you to lift that 250-foot manda mandatory buffer. And th they accepted that in 92, and we're continuing that now. So we have made efforts to amend what the state minimums are to reflect, reflect local conditions. But the real problem there, frankly, is not the shoreland zoning. It's the 250-foot buffer that is locally imposed by the town. And it's been discussed many times. And, this and maybe this particular time, the town will want to change it. But uh, there's been no recommendation, uh, absent some clear direction by the planning board or the council. Staff's not going to make any recommendation along that line because it's, it's consistent with the policy that the town has tested numerous times. But the, this, um, the addition along Filer and Fenway, yeah. is, this is new area. Exactly. In theory, I don't see, I don't really see it as new area. Because our local ordinance says you have to field verify the actual RP1 boundary, mm -hmm. um, I don't think it, 
in practice, I don't see the boundary actually changing. I'm showing this as a change because the state's going to be looking at these maps and checking to make sure that the town is complying with their minimums. But the language in our ordinance today that says you have to map the wetland edge and that's where the wetland edge really is, is not being changed by this shoreland zoning package of amendments. So that line is a fluid line and, and the shoreland zoning is tied to that wetland up on the edge. So the shoreland zoning line is going to be fluid. But you need to keep in mind that the shoreland zoning, the over the shoreland zoning 250 feet doesn't say you can't build within 250 feet. It sets a 75 or 100 foot setback and then there are things you can do. In this particular area, the, the layer of regulation that is most restrictive is the town's local 250 foot buffer. But that's, does that help? Does that answer your question? That's a no-build area. I mean, for it's existing for, homes in it that is area. for existing homes. There are provisions in the local ordinance that mm -hmm. allow some expansion of non-conforming structures. There, if you're within 25 feet, you can do certain expansions as long as you're not going closer to the wetland. If you're more than 100 feet away, you actually can expand toward the wetland a certain amount. Some of these look like they're in. And some of them might be almost in. And what kind of relief for the people that are in those zones? For, I mean, you can repair what there, you own. You, you absolutely, you can repair and maintain what you own. There's a variance provision that one person has actually used oh, on the corner of Fenway and Fowler Road. Um, and there are provisions it's in the TVA. current... They went to the zoning board and they were able to get an expansion that exceeded the cap of 25% that is locally applied. Okay. Um, but then there's, again, there, there are some non-conforming provisions in the current ordinance and how they apply to Mr. Uh, Roberts' uh, property, I, I haven't, I don't know. Well, I did suggest he meet for. with the code officer to determine whether the current non-conforming provisions would allow him to do what he had wanted to do before. And I'm not specifically, I'm looking at that one as an example, yeah. but I, what I right. see is a swath of homes. The, the old colony. On, 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 as Mr. Roberts <laughs> points out, the, the opposite side of, Fe, of uh, Fowler, right. and then a, a huge chunk of Fenway. I mean, right. and these are, um, you know, and, and then Mr. Silva's point about the one, do I have your name right? The, yeah. the uh, old colony is the same way. Yeah. I mean, these, these people have to have some sort of relief to, at least, you know, to, Maintain what they own, and, and I would, and and, and, yeah. and possibly expand with. Uh, I, I didn't realize there was a potential for a variance, because it seems to. Well, be, but to, if there's a cap, of you course. can only get so much. Um, but again, I, you know, I understand that the shoreland zoning is 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 a, a rude awakening, perhaps. Mm. Um, but if you start looking at the regulations, in my opinion, they um, exist it's the local exist. regulations that are really more more restrictive to what people can do with their property. Well, the impression I'm getting is this seems to be perceived as, as we didn't have this before. Our house is now in this zone. And the response I'm hearing, and please correct me if I don't have it correct, is, um, is that some of these were actually in the zone if you had, had to field map some of these. these. These properties got thrown into this district in May of 1990. Okay. And there is some relief provision. Sure, I'm sorry. No, we have second. several um, exceptions. What is it, five now, where you can have a 100-foot buffer instead of a 250-foot buffer? Yes. And it may be prudent to add a sixth exception, which would be that existing homes as of X date can be subject to the 100-foot buffer rather than the 250-foot buffer. It isn't going to cure this 100%. But it's sure going to cure a lot of it, at least eyeballing it, it's going to cure a lot of it. So I'd say we might strongly want to consider adding another 100 foot. Just, just to note, under section 1943, nonconformance um, in the shoreland zone out for the resource protection districts. What page do you have, Marie? Uh, for you guys, it would be starting on page 41. We all have our new copies have with us. New copies. <laughs> uh, resource protection. If you have a structure in the RP1 district, that's in the dark green area, 
Um, you can expand the floor area volume by up to 25 percent of the size of the structure, but you cannot expand the existing building footprint. If you are in the critical wetland overlay, that's the 250 foot buffer, or in the RP2 district, um, you cannot expand the building footprint closer than the shortest non-conforming setback distance from the wetland upland edge. Uh, in no event shall any expansion be within 25 feet of the wetland upland edge. And again, you're capped at 25 percent maximum coverage. So if you're, you're within 100 feet and you have a building that is irregularly shaped, you can fill in the ir irregular parts. But if, you're, if your building is within 100 feet and you have a flat edge and you want to go out this way towards the wetland, you can't do it. And that's actually a fairly common interpretation in shoreland zoning mm. as well as for our local wetland regulations. You can go sideways. You can go away from the wetland. Clearly, for some properties, this is incredibly inconvenient because the only way you want to expand is the way you're not allowed to expand. Yeah, but I think there's another point that I believe Jack brought up, and that was that you have to, if you want to sell your property, then you have to announce to the whole wide world that <laughs> you're in you the 254. No. But, it, but if we made a, a six, if we reduce the buffer only on existing homes, only that we're in this buffer. But Barbara, we, we have another provision here that if you are more than 100 feet away from the wetland, which is equivalent to what you're talking about, reducing the buffer to 100 feet. You can expand 50 feet in any direction as long as you don't make the expansion too large, which is very close to what you're talking about in terms of reducing the buffer down to 100 feet for, for existing buildings. And that would be on page 42, paragraph 3. It says, the main building may be expanded a distance of not more than 50 feet from the building footprint. No expansion shall be permitted, which is larger than 25 percent of the size of the structure at the time it became nonconforming. So I think your original idea is somewhat represented in that paragraph. How many of these, how, how many of these properties are newly in the wetland zone that has now been and added? I would, argue, I would argue that because of the shoreland zoning, no properties are being added that weren't there in May of 1990. The, the real impact on these properties was when the town adopted its local wetland regulations in, in May of 1990. So this is essentially a 19-year-old problem that nobody knew about? I was not question. working here in May of 1990 <laughs> and can plead ignorance about the level of noticing that was provided, I do know that there was three years worth of work on the wetlands regulations by the Conservation Commission and the Planning Board. Uh, I know there was a lot of coverage in the local newspaper over it. Uh, whether or not individual maps were mailed to property owners, I suspect not. Um, but for something that happened almost 20 years ago. Well, I'm just thinking how we can a little better today. My, my, my view of, of these regulations, schemes in general, is if you're going to set up these protections, you'll leave them in place. And then you use, to me, the variance provisions to try to sort of fix the problem areas. I think when you start to micromanage the regulations themselves. But we have micromanaged the regulations. Well, and I don't like that approach, Barbara. No, we the have. Point, but, well, in, in general terms, I agree with you. But I'm saying maybe there is a provision like you say, um, to make exceptions, but put, put that power in, 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 in the variance uh, uh, potential and have them bring it to, to a different board to see if, if things can be done. How does that differ from changing the regulation? Because you're, the business you're, addressing, you're addressing, addressing the individual it. cases without eviscerating them. No, you're just saying that houses that are existing in these areas um, you can make a sixth provision that they can be subject to the 100-foot setback. But I, I think what Maureen was suggesting is there's enough in here already that they get at least that much. Yeah, if, they're, if you're beyond 100 feet, you can expand 50 feet in any direction as long as you don't cross that magic 100-foot line. The other thing in the variance provision, oh, if you have an existing building that's not located in the resource protection critical wetland, 
you can go to the Zoning Board of Appeals and get a variance for your proposed expansion um, as long as you don't exceed 40% of the main building size. But Maureen, you're adding another layer. I mean, I... I this already. Well, it doesn't exist if you add another provision. And when you say we're micromanaging, we've done it. I mean, this is no different than doing it any other time. Um, then they don't have to go to the zoning board. It's in, it's in the code. Maureen, I have another question on, on a separate <clears throat> topic. Um, it, it has to do with the um, precedence, if you will, of the field mapping taking a greater priority over the current mapping, where the, um, the wetland increases in size rather than a minor change to where the upland edge is, but rather significantly increases. Um, and I'm, I'm actually very specifically thinking of the old Colony Lane situation. Um, what redress do those property owners have? I believe the interpretation that we've taken is that the map has to be field verified. And the actual physical characteristics that make a wetland are defined in the zoning ordinance. Right. It says you have to have very poorly drained soils, you have to have at least an acre, or you have to have obligate wetland vegetation of at least an acre. And if you have those characteristics, that makes you an RP1 wetland. Right. So regardless of whether it's on the map, right. when they adopted that in May 1990, it became regulated. Right, and, and I understand that. My concern is that if you are a property purchaser, and you've looked at the maps and you've made your determination that you're, you're not at that point in time within a wetland protected area or the 250 foot buffer but there has been a change in the characteristic of some abutting property um, that is greater than 10 acres and as a result of that change that that physical change in that abutting property your land has now been subjected to the 250 foot buffer what redress do you have then I just want to make sure it's clear. You know, this is not a policy that I dreamed up. In oh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, it's not personal. I'm just trying this to figure is, out what happens. I was handed this and I work with it. Um, in terms of whether or not you knew you had a wetland. Yeah. Um, it, you know, as I've asked this question before and the answer that's been given to me is it's buyer beware. Yeah. I can, I can assure you that anytime anyone walks into the office and asks me about Mm -hmm. you know, can I build on my property? The first question I ask them is, have you mapped your wetlands? Mm -hmm. um, and you really do need to be vigilant about making sure you have buildable property um, when, when you buy it. As for physical changes, um, that I would, I'm, a, I'm imagining a situation where an abutting property has changed the drainage configuration. Right. And that's where you really look at civil issues. There are people who call us and say, there's water coming on my property that hasn't been there before. And it's like, you, you, need, to, you need to get legal advice. You need to pursue that um, as a private matter. Okay, and that's as against an abutting property owner who might be changing the use of their property or something and, and has an adverse the impact. physical characteristics of their property. And, 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 and this might be a unique situation um, that it's a natural change. Beavers. Uh, beaver. Beavers are a problem. Yeah. Or, or they're wonderful one way or the other. Um, For most people, they're, with the, the town has had some serious problems with uh, culverts being flooded out. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had problems with uh, the Conservation Commission with trail work where you build a boardwalk and then the beavers inundate your boardwalk and you need right. boardwalk basically over the entire property. Um, you know, removal is something that happens. But just procedurally then, is, is that a redress issue that goes to the uh, BZA? I have never seen that application made. I don't know what would happen if someone took it forward. If they bought a variance request? Yeah. That would be interesting. Okay. First impression. I think you got a good shot. Okay. Thank you. And Maureen, I have a question about um, an opposite situation. So say um, a property like um, Mr. Roberts along Fowler Road is designated as a wetland and um, field testing shows that it's not a wetland. Where, where in the ordinance 
ordinance does it say it has to be um, field verified? And, and would that solve Mr. Roberts' problem with the five-foot addition? It, if, Mr. Indeed, I, be I believe Mr. Roberts' problem is that he is within 250 feet of an RP1 wetland. It's not that his property is subject to, it's, it's overlaid with shoreland zoning. Every time you compare the shoreland zoning to the resource protection 250-foot buffer, uh -huh. our 250-foot buffer is more strict. Gotcha. It's, you know, the, I have yet to see the situation where you might have been allowed to do something under the buffer and you weren't allowed to do it under the shoreland zoning. Gotcha. It's, Although it's a our local standards that are, seems, that are, pardon me? A five-foot addition yeah, seems like it might. And, and, and I, I don't know exception. whether... Okay. Mr. Roberts would be able to make his five-foot addition under the current regulations. Gotcha. Right. All right. And certainly, we could ask for the code enforcement officer to provide a written opinion on whether or not that particular project would be allowed under the current provisions. Right. Okay. Um, your question about um, the mapping. Yep. Okay. Starting with. Okay, starting on page 123, um, under paragraph 1C, and this is just for the RP1 district. The town has prepared a zoning map showing the RP1 critical wetland district based upon the best available information at a town-wide scale. The actual boundaries of the district, however, shall be determined by field verification in accordance with section 1925, location of resource protection district boundaries. And you will find similar information, similar language in the uh, RP2 district and the RP3 district. Thanks. And then there is a whole extra section that talks about delineation of boundaries and the, what the code officer is required to do. And if there is a disagreement with the code officer's determination on wetland boundaries, it gets referred to the planning board. And there have been two instances in the past where the planning board has had to make a determination of where a wetland boundary was. One of those determinations was uh, brought to court and the town prevailed. Maureen, maybe I'm not understanding something here either. The dates on these maps, when you have two maps and there's a lot of changes, are the same. Uh -huh. So which map is... Are you talking about the date at the very bottom? Yeah. The date at the very bottom is the date that I made the map. Okay. So what I have is, what I've tried to do is, is zoom in on the existing zoning map and show you what that looks like today. Okay. And then... It says existing zoning. It says existing zoning. And then giving you the same view, only I've turned on all the changes, so it says shoreland zoning amendments. Okay. So you can go back and forth and, you know, it's kind of like a little bit like where's Waldo, but, um, you know, what, what has changed. So then this is the... And what you should focus on are, are the hatched areas primarily. The green hatch is added RP1, the red hatch is deleted RP1, and then you've got dotted areas. The dotted areas is added shoreland zoning and the red dotted is deleted shoreland zoning. Mm -hmm. So really, in the Fowler Road case, it would probably be that 100-foot buffer, since that's, isn't the 250-foot buffer just in certain critical areas, but we, the 100-foot? We've already, foot. I mean, we've already tried to recognize that there are neighborhoods perched on Great Pond by eliminating the heavy dark line on yep. that northern right. corner of, corner or point of, of Great Pond, so that you at least can apply get your buffer reduced if you meet certain conditions. Gotcha. Okay. Maureen, I want to commend you for your mapping. It's uh, very illustrative. You did a great job. It, 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 it really did a great job. Thank you. Since uh, we're also the advising body here, you know, we're, we're, the final say is the town council. So if there's 
uh, other equitable considerations, I'm sure they'll be happy to hear them. Um, I mean, I think we need to approach this from a planning perspective. And at this point, I'm kind of satisfied. We've tried to address everything that we are, we've been asked to address. We've noticed the public hearing. We've taken the comments. Uh, I certainly have a great deal of sympathy. I, I wish I had some other solutions for the more specific problems that this causes. Uh, I do hear what the planner is saying about, uh, to a large degree, this has been the way it is since the early 1990s. But uh, our task is to make a recommendation one way or the other to the town council. So we have satisfied the notice and requirements. We've, we've, had, about that. <laughs> we've had more than adequate notice. We've had two public hearings. Uh, on it, we've had input, and at this point, I think we just need a motion to either recommend the set of maps that we have and the changes that we have, or, or, or in the text changes, or, or bringing it back for a workshop to work on it some more, right? Yep. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion. Tom, you're the motion guy tonight. Go ahead. A uh, motion for the board to consider that the 2009 Shoreland Zoning Amendments and amendments to the official zoning map be recommended to the town council for consideration, including the text amendment. Motion having been made, do I hear a second? Um, Liza Quinn, for the record. Um, motion having been made by Tom Dolan, seconded by Liza Quinn. Do I have any discussion on the motion? Any questions, comments, additions? Can I just ask a quick question, Maureen? The email that we got today from Jay Cox and from Carol. Um, with regard to the stream definitions. Yes. Can you just comment on that? Sure. Um, the stream definition that we have in the ordinance right now is almost exactly what the state requires. The only thing I did not put in there is I said, this doesn't cover, it's, it's um, in his text. Um, yes. Certainly you can add it in if you want to, but we have a stream definition that's exactly the same as the state. Then we have a tributary stream definition, which is almost exactly the same as the state. The only thing I left out is for tributary stream, this definition does not include the term stream as defined elsewhere in this ordinance and only applies to that portion of the tributary stream located within the shoreland zone of the receiving water body or wetland. So if you wanted to add that last sentence, certainly you can. So that's not in the package we have right now? No, but if you wanted to amend the package you have right now by inclusion of that, I can pop it right in. But that doesn't address the point of the issue. I think his point is he would like the, the, the language in bold that I just read added to the definition of tributary stream. It, it, just, it just makes it absolutely clear that there are certain properties that would be excluded or certain portions of properties that would be excluded. So if we were to amend my original motion to uh, include the text amendments and that language as just read, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make an amendment to my motion. I have a proposed amendment to the motion. Do I have a second? That was your second, Liza. Yes. Any other discussions or questions? No, I'm, I'm done with my questions. Thank you. That's a good idea. Comments, thoughts? Hearing none, there's a motion on the table that's been duly seconded. All in favor of the motion? Any opposed? Uh, motion carries six nothing, and that's our last item on the agenda. Do I have any motions? Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a final motion to adjourn this evening. Could I second that, please? Certainly. All in favor? We are adjourned.